Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm Commodore Retired Sadeed Malik. I'm the Chief Executive of uh, Karachi Council on Foreign Relations. It's an honor and a great pleasure, Your Excellency, to welcome you and as desired by you that it should be just an informal meeting. So we just have the members of the Board of Governors and uh, as it is in an informal meeting, I thought we should very briefly introduce to each other before Absolutely. we get on to that That's informal very discussion. Very you have met our chairman on your right, Chairman Ikram Sagal. And uh, before I introduce him, I think I should introduce you to our uh, Please do. Ambassador, His Excellency Bernard Stephen Schleghark is a career diplomat and uh, he graduated in law and economics and after that uh, he started his banking career but then he shifted to uh, diplomacy and then he was uh, into different countries, Kuwait, NATO, Brussels, European Council, Moscow. Uh, then he was a secretary general level to the uh, to the uh, chief of the secretary general of uh, UNO. Then he was in Nigeria, and now he is uh, ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to Pakistan. And on his left is the uh, Consul General Holger Zelger, whom we uh, meet in Karachi very often at uh, all the diplomatic functions. On your right, sir, is our chairman, Ikram Sekhar. He heads a uh, group of companies, of uh, nine companies, but they have been added. Nine were when we started, when I started as Secretary as, 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 as General. So he has more companies. He is the founding member of World Economic Forum at Davos and uh, I had forwarded to nearly all the Consul Generals what all he did this time and uh, perhaps it has gone through your eye also. Uh, our, on your left is uh, Admiral Khalid Mir. He is three star Admiral. Uh, he has done nearly all the commands of Pakistan Navy and uh, he commanded the fleet and then uh, he was done all the deputy chief etc etc and then he was an ambassador of Pakistan then he was chief chairman of Karachi Port Trust and he has many many of the social organizations right here in Pakistan and he is our co-chair our uh, co-chair person uh, is about to arrive she is in traffic and she is the Director of the university and about to arrive. She, she telephoned that she stuck up in a block. Uh, our co chairman, our vice chair, chairman, Mr. Uh, Javed, uh, Javed Ashraf, he is a federal secretary retired and uh, he has been uh, the head of uh, province of Karachi as chief secretary. And then after retirement, he is a member of a number of social organizations and is our vice chairman. On his right is our treasurer, a leading businessman of uh, Karachi, and uh, he chairs the uh, English speaking union of Pakistan. And if I start this thing, I would take more time, so much time, that I don't wish to come in between uh, Rotary and etc. 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 On, uh, on his right is uh, Mrs. Nadra Pajwani, a professor, university professor, and teacher, and a philanthropist, a great philanthropist in education and health. We have Air Marshal uh, Dablin Sheer, member of the Board of Governor and uh, three-star Air Force uh, uh, General uh, Air, uh, Air Marshal and he has done everything <coughs> except, the chief, except being the Chief of Deputy Chief, Vice Chief, uh, Area Commanders, basically the uh, fighter pilot. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Fadu Kavzal, uh, he is a leading businessman of Karachi. He is an exporter and uh, he is the chairman of uh, Park Turkish uh, uh, Park uh, Association and a number of other associations which I, I think would take a long time to describe. On, on the extreme left is Dr. Azim Akbar. He, he has headed 
the oil industry in UAE. He was the advisor of the previous chair, not the president, but the previous chair, and head and uh, chief advisor to Adenor, Abu Dhabi the National Oil Company. So uh, we have a great. Uh, there is uh, uh, one of our members of the board of governors, Khan Bandi. He is a, in the marine business and he acknowledges ships coming to Karachi all over and he, he is on the travel and somehow he was here, here and we are able to grab hold of him. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. There are two other members who will come and I will tell you where they come. Actually, uh, Germany has been a very, very dear country to all of us ever since centuries. We have, our knowledge of Germany has been since <coughs> you know, people thought he has sent an envoy to two countries, countries, namely Germany and France. And uh, after that, uh, if, I, if you permit me, something my personal, yeah. one of my paternal uncles, he refused to come back after doing his PhD at Cambridge and he went to yes. Germany yes. before the Second World War. Oh. He stayed in East Berlin and was taken away by Russians and he never returned from Siberia. And but we have a great regard, great regard for Germany and uh, all over the history. And therefore I invite uh, you and the members to start your informal discussion soon. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for this very um, kind of introduction. Uh, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, this is the, I think, the fifth time so I, uh, I come to Karachi. But so far, so far, I haven't made it to this prestigious council. And since my tenure is drawing to a close now, I thought I have to see you and meet you at least uh, uh, if I come for the last time. To which I actually do. So I, my, my tenure ends by the end of the month and I, I'm here in, uh, in Pakistan and I just wanted to see you. I mean, pay my respect to this very prestigious and very, I would say, traditional, one of the most traditional uh, council on foreign relations of the country. Um, and also, of course, uh, seize the opportunity to have a kind of uh, open and possibly framed discussion with you. Because that is, I do not want to, to, to make big words now on Germany, on our, I would say, bilateral relations, although there is a lot, as uh, you already uh, alluded to, there's a lot good to say. I mean, I think we have very trusted. A very uh, long-standing <coughs> political, economic, uh, military, uh, but also cultural and people-to-people -people relations, which uh, is uh, something I think we all can be proud of. But I would rather prefer to have uh, a sort of uh, exchange of views with you on perhaps the prospects of uh, uh, Pakistani, European, Pakistani, German cooperation in the future, and perhaps also about the overall situation, foreign policy situation, because this is the council uh, particularly devoted to foreign policy issues, uh, on the strategic and foreign policy situation of the country, of your country. So um, perhaps a word on brief word on our bilateral relation. I mean, we, 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 we had a Nadia last year with the celebration of the uh, of 70 years of diplomatic relations between our two countries. I mean, that was relatively lavish, lavishly celebrated. I, it started here in Karachi. We had a, um, we had a, a, a vessel, a Bundeswehr, a German uh, Navy vessel here. For, a re relative, relatively rare occasion. I think it was the first after I don't know twenty years or so. Uh, but it was um, it was um, in 
reciprocity of a of a of a, uh, a, a, a ship visit of the Pakistani Navy in Hamburg. So that I would say ushered in uh, sort of what we call German Greeks in Pakistan, which then had uh, of course the central um, event in Islamabad with the minister and a number of ministers. Uh, but uh, also had a German, I would say, business um, business week in the hall with a showcasing. I greet you, my lady. Very good to see you. Uh, you have uh, already been introduced. Yes, to yes. yes I think were, the pleasure you, of yeah, seeing you. Yeah, already pretty on a couple of occasions, actually. I was so uh, eager to see you. Thank you so now, much. Anyway, so we are on. Um, I think on a very good basis, uh, and uh, yes, uh, of course, but it's good, can always be better, uh, but uh, I think we are making um, a constant progress in, I would say, consolidating our bilateral relation. Our uh, foreign minister was in Pakistan in Islamabad uh, early uh, last week. Unfortunately, she had uh, to cut short her visit because she then contracted uh, uh, coronavirus, but at least she had a very, uh, I would say, very substantive uh, discussion with the Foreign Minister. Uh, it uh, lasted uh, much longer than we, really. I mean, you know, the embassy is always then very busy in making all the arrangements than we expected it to be. So it lasted for more than three hours, and I think there was a sort of purpose of relatively young people. I mean, Bilal Sadawi and our foreign minister are basically in the 30s. So there, I think they, 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 they struck a, a chord uh, with each other or with one another, and that was good. Uh, we made also, I think, some considerable progress in our. Uh, in our bilateral agenda, but also in the GSP Plus issue, which is of, as you all know, of utmost importance uh, for both. I mean, it's a, basically it's a win-win scheme, uh, but of, uh, I would say, it's a very great importance to particularly the Pakistani textile industry. So that I think should suffice. I would. Uh, be very happy if we could enter into a kind of uh, conversation about the uh, German, European, uh, Pakistani uh, foreign policy relations and particular prospects. And I would be very interested to have your view. I mean, I'm, of course, that is the nature of things, very much Islamabad based, but I know that uh, this country, and that is one of the great, I would say, the great, um, uh, the great uh, advantages of this country, this great, great diversity, and sometimes uh, aspects coming from the very important business and, and uh, social centers like Karachi, uh, that are not always, I would say, decently and appropriately reflected in the discussions in, uh, in the Islamabad. So that is also uh, for me an opportunity to uh, have from uh, uh, very important and uh, uh, relevant members of, I would say, Karachi society, uh, uh, your view on foreign policy in the region, foreign policy between uh, Pakistan and Europe, and perhaps prospects uh, for, the, for, for, for times to come. For the moment, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very, um, um, for, for this very kind invitation. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. And, uh, uh, well, as you said that we are we have just celebrated the 70th uh, anniversary of the relationship Germany and Pakistan. I would just like to mention a few uh, points. Uh, I think that uh, our intellectual and our ideological father, 
But now my father, he spent a lot of time in Germany and Heidelberg. And in fact, he said that my, my life in Germany was a very sweet dream. Uh, I think there is a road after his day in Heidelberg. And uh, also there is a commemorative play of Adama Ibn there. He studied uh, Kant and other philosophers also. Um, so, but when we remember it well, we remember Ruth Fowl. Dr. Ruth Fowl, she spent 55 years in Pakistan looking after the university and all that, and she will always remain in our hearts. So, that, uh, these are the elements which really count so much in Pakistan and Germany relationship. <laughs> and then, obviously, there is a uh, Pakistan has a one of the few countries, Germany, that Pakistan has a trade surplus, which is a very uh, good uh, thing, and I hope that we can ease this trade surplus. Uh, I think there are mainly textile and leather, but I believe that we can expand it to other areas like uh, IT. I think IT is an area where Pakistan has a lot of trade, in it. and Pakistan is. And, you know, increasing its export in IT, and I think with Germany cooperation, we can really do a lot more. Uh, other thing which uh, I would like to say is that I think there are some agreements between Germany and Pakistan, and those agreements, one of them is about cooperation in technology and research. I would uh, request, I would suggest that we should increase activities in that area. I am a technologist myself, so I can understand how ferociously and speedily technology is changing our lives. And I think that this is an area where we can possibly do, uh, increase our population and it would be a great uh, thing for Pakistan. So these are the areas where we can really uh, increase our cooperation and all that. And in technology, if uh, you need some further discussions that what we can do, I'm available for those discussions. Uh, so I think these were a few points. There are a lot of things we can talk about Germany, but these are these points which I thought are important to mention. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I actually the first remark. I I have to say, I, I, I never read any countries that were so generous and so hospitable as Pakistan. I mean, as a diplomat, you are uh, mostly being treated quite kindly by your host, I would say, society. But, uh, uh, but I've uh, witnessed the Pakistan top four. I mean, you come to the last uh, village in the Luchistan, the people, you know, you are not able to speak any kind of language that's been spoken there and uh, are being treated uh, nonetheless uh, in such a friendly, amicable, hard, hard firm way. That is really amazing. But on what you said, yes, I think there is a, I think, a, how to say, a mentality basis uh, emanating from, I would say, very eminent uh, personalities. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal is one of them. And Iqbal himself, he was very much related to your daughter, Kulturji, which is our national poet. And Iqbal actually wrote very uh, uh, distinctively on Goethe's work. I mean, Goethe was roughly 100 years older than Iqbal, he was uh, dead as Iqbal came to uh, Germany, but he was, I would say, uh, uh, quite severely impressed by Goethe's outreach, particularly to the Muslim world. This very famous East-West bar, which had been uh, authored by Johan Wolfgang von Goethe, I think a great impact on Mohammed big part. And uh, he's from France, quite very German. I mean, I, I, I came across uh, some letters, he had, a, he had a quite 
relation with the landlady he was living with in Heidelberg. And he wrote from Pakistan, he returned back to Pakistan at some stage, I think via the uh, Great Britain or uh, Inca at that time, uh, as he returned back to uh, Pakistan. And at least in the first years or so, he wrote letters in almost, I would say, perfect German to this lady. So it was amazing. It was really amazing. Uh, but then you have, of course, you are totally right. I mean, there is huge potential in, I would say, bearing up the degree of our bilateral trade relations. It's indeed very much still, uh, I would say, determined by, as you said, uh, textile, leather, uh, surgical instrument and these kind of things. And I think we have to climb up the, I would say, the, the value chain ladder. And IT is certainly one of the options. I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing on that scenery, particularly here in Karachi and in Lahore. Uh, some of that is a bit lagging behind, but they are really interesting startups. And by the way, these startups, they are making money without the, without the state, without the government. And talking to them, sometimes they are saying, uh, you are asking them what could uh, the, the government, what could we as embassies do in order to promote and foster your business? And they are saying, the best thing you can do is simply let us alone. <coughs> simply let us alone. And I think this is, uh, it's really, they are profitable, they are good, they are innovative and I think there is a lot to be seen in the future, particularly from IT and IT services. So you are right, this is something that we should embark upon. And then also, as you said, um, uh, 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 research and uh, uh, I mean what we, uh, research and development, that is for the moment Unfortunately, a bit under, I would say, under, I would, would not say underestimated, but it's a bit under um, appreciated, perhaps. Uh, but you said, yes, there are uh, agreements that need to be filled with a bit more of both. We have uh, roughly, I would say, uh, 10,000 10 to 50,000 Pakistani students in Germany. That becomes increasingly popular because it's basically tuition free. So it's uh, rather attractive to Pakistani, uh, very, I would say, very uh, uh, qualified Pakistani students to go to Germany instead of the US and UK, which, as we all know, cost a fraction to study there. So there is, I think there is potential. There are even some German students now here. I think we have some at Lums in the hall. But uh, as you said, there is certainly a leeway to go still. But I agree with you, these are uh, areas of cooperation of the future. Okay. Yeah. 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 And in between two charming ladies, you want to make sure you Germany has done a lot for us, and it still is doing. But there is a lot more that can be done. Today is special because the FATF meeting is taking place in Germany. Right. As far as the GSP Plus is concerned, I know had it not been for Germany, we would not have got that. There were your counterparts at that time who really pushed for GSP. Germany also happens to be the greatest trading partner as far as Pakistan is concerned. Yeah. The two nations with which Pakistan actually cooperated at the formative stages of Germany and Japan, one in the east, one in the west. But what we see with the paradigm shift in the international, international relations, more of what happens to Pakistan depends upon the big brothers in the west thinking about Pakistan. Is Germany going to be independent of those influences? Because Pakistan is a country of 220 million. There's a lot that can, we can benefit from each other. 
for instance, you know, I grew up with names like Volkswagen, Grand you name it, Opel. Where is it? It's not there anymore. Others have come in. Germany still has a chance to come in. I'm part of the uh, GPCCI. I'm a director there. We have been trying. We have been there. We had a fake MOU signed with Audi. Volkswagen was thinking about coming, but nothing happened. Your views on that? If well, you would. First of all, thank you very much. I, I would say on the uh, prospects for German, let's say, uh, engagement industry, yeah. you know, yeah. engagement in Pakistan, I would perhaps ask uh, my colleague, Paul Ziegler, who is my uh, esteemed uh, colleague and friend, to um, um, uh, elaborate a bit on that because there is something. I would say to tell also when it comes, as you mentioned, Volkswagen, that in general, um, I understand your question as asking how is the overall geostrategic landscape impacting on countries like Germany and Pakistan. And here I would say, yes, you're right, we are seeing a uh, uh, Kind of you mentioned, or you talk, uh, you 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 uh, cited it as a kind of paradigm shift. We have a sort of shift in international relations. I mean, unfortunately, the area of I would say uh, uh, multilateralism in a classical sense quite over. Yeah? We are now edging towards a more polarized world again, multi. Polar, uh, uh, I would say, a multipolar scheme with uh, very distinctive poles. Uh, basically, two poles: the United States on the, other, on the one hand, China on the other. And yes, of course, that has uh, that has uh, uh, implications for the rest of the world. Uh, however, I think there are, I would say, some. I would not say that we are seeing Pakistan or the foreign policy elite of Pakistan or Germany, that we are seeing eye to eye in each and everything. This is not necessary. I mean, Pakistan is part of a different, I would say, geographical and political landscape. That, um, what I sense is that there is a common understanding that we don't want to fall into the trap of a pure binarism. A binarism, <coughs> I mean, we have had that in Europe. I mean, after the Second World War, <coughs> until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And our experience with this binary, uh, how to say, scheme, political scheme, uh, are not that pleasant. It was uh, a harsh time particular for Germany, which was divided, as you know. So, uh, at the, I would say, the albatross of an all-out war hanging over Germany for almost 40 years. So, I think there is nothing to wish for to be again in such a binary, or in a, uh, how, how should I say that, it's this camp mentality. I mean, you have to be in one camp or the other. There is no third option. I think it's Pakistan's, and my sense is that is understood by most in government, regardless whether it was the previous government or the government now. And to a large extent, it's even better understood by the what we call here the establishment. That I think we. Somehow should try to be in the midst of all this violinism. We should try to not to fall into that trap of camp mentality. We should try to be in contact with all. We should try to make uh, you know uh, it, to make it possible to uh, engage and interact across these camps that are building up. And that does not mean, by the way, that we should not stick to our principles. I mean, that is what we are seeing now in this Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, spat and uh, uh, 
conflict, uh, the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. Here again, uh, I would say my government and the Pakistani government have, I would say, slightly different opinions on that. The Pakistani government kept previous and the uh, uh, incumbent government, they kept the, uh, I would say, position, principle position that Pakistan does not want to be dragged in, into a conflict that is not of the region, that is not uh, of immediate concern, of immediate concern to Pakistan. And therefore, uh, it should uh, uh, maintain this neutral stance that uh, Pakistan has executed so far, particularly within the United Nations and the Human Rights Council and so on and so forth. We, however, also from our experience uh, of the Cold War, I mean, we are of the opinion we, sh we cannot we cannot accept, we cannot tolerate blatant and frightened violation of international law, which has been, at least in our reading, the backbone of this uh, Russian aggression. And again, I think sometimes I'm, I'm a bit, you know, when I'm discussing with my Pakistani friends and partners or collaborators in, in Islamabad, sometimes I think there is a kind of argument being put forward by the Russians that is even, I would say, dangerous for a country like Pakistan, although I don't, uh, I don't uh, uh, ignore the fact that, of course, Pakistan is an atomic power, and that makes things certainly different, that, that the Russian approach is to say Ukraine basically doesn't exist. It's a concoction a historic concoction. It has no right to exist basically in Russia. I mean, it's an all Russian idea of the, I would say, of the rural Eurasian continent. And sometimes I, I was wondering why the Indians, for instance, could not apply that argument too. They say, well, basically, uh, you know, South Asia, this is an Indian idea. And Pakistan, by the way, does not exist does not have a right to exist. So I think this kind of argument put forward by the Russians, I mean, to deny the very existence of a country that had been internationally recognized, by the way. It's not that there had been a dispute between Russia and Ukraine about the very legitimate existence of this country that had been recognized. But then to say, well, historically, and, you know, uh, judging from mentality, there is no <coughs> space for a country like Ukraine. It's basically all Russian. It's Russian or it's Nazi. Uh, there is nothing between. And if it's Nazi, it needs to be rooted out. And if it's Russian, well, then it must be fine if the Russians come and take it back. I think this is a very, very, very dangerous argumentation. And I would wish at some stage that the Pakistani policy politics would have been a bit more forthcoming in condemning these uh, policies. But I understand, of course, there are different uh, viewpoints from here. And Bilawal uh, Bhutu uh, he told me already twice, he also uh, told the minister uh, now, that of course there is an experience uh, here in Pakistan of being dragged into uh, conflicts, you know, Afghanistan and all that. So you might say Pakistan has to some extent burned its fingers in the past and does not want to burn its fingers now in a conflict that is not directly related to the region. Um, on the team, on the, I, I would say, German uh, industrial uh, engagement. I have to say, it's not yet over, but there is a meeting in Berlin. It's not, it's not uh, led by the Germans, it's just hosted by the Germans. You know, the FATF, this is the international forum. And, you know, 
each country every, I don't know, four or five years is hosting the, the meeting. So it's just by coincidence that's in Berlin. It's not intentional or it's because it's now a very crucial meeting for Pakistan. My sense is, I was misquoted, I spoke to some journalists in uh, Salabad uh, on uh, Saturday, and it was in the, now it was in today's press that I said Pakistan will most probably uh, be removed from the playlist. I did not say that. What I said was, I think that the likelihood that Pakistan, because of the, I would say, quite remarkable progress made and successes scored in a number of areas. I mean, starting from money laundering to anti-terrorist activities, that the likelihood that Pakistan is at some stage be removed from the grey list is relatively high. Uh, you know, embassies, we, we are not, I would say, immediately involved in that because it's in our system, but also with the Americans and with many other countries, it's being run by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, but, of course, I know by and large how things stand, and I think there is a decent chance that the plenary now in Berlin will decide on a so-called site visit. This is a delegation coming here, checking once again what has been done over the last years. And in the light of that site visit, and assumed the result is, and I think it will be, or it ought to be uh, positive, the next plenary in order to build them, uh, Pakistan will move from the greatest. That is my expectation. That, of course, since I'm not holding the shots in that forum, I cannot give you any kind of uh, uh, guarantee uh, or pledge on that regard. So I cannot say Pakistan will be removed from the greatest. There are others, there's a technical form, and there are others. Uh, I mean, some of your de dearest friends from the neighborhoods are also part of the FATF, and perhaps they have different uh, views on that. So it's, it's always a process and a delicate process but by and large I think the prospects are relatively uh, uh, positive. What is happening in Ukraine and what could possibly happen between India and Pakistan of not accepting the existence <coughs> like in the case of Russia saying so but the history of Russia as a country is been there. India was never a country. India was just states. There's never been a country. No, and, and, and I think the other thing that has been there is that this is a different state. To say that it did not exist is a different ball game. It's not quite the same. And again, the history. If Berlin Wall has come down, it is because the Russians agreed to something. The war of it by far. So <laughs> even Don it Absolutely. may not have been written, but it, he said that um, it would be the last place. And when they were due to weapons, which were brought first NATO into Germany, there was a protest. Right. And Poland was not supposed to become a part and parcel of NATO. None of those states were, as per that agreement. Otherwise, the Berlin Wall would have come down. No, so there is a lot of history. Absolutely. It's there lots of history between no, India right. and Pakistan also, similar. But because what Kashmir is, is a different thing. It is predominantly, predominantly, quite in a manner, what uh, maybe Ukraine is not predominantly Russian, but there is a large amount of Russian there. Well, there, there is are dominant and there is Muslim. So it is the same ethnic background. Therefore, there is a greater affiliation with this part of the subcontinent than that part. But mind you, it's not my argument to say Ukraine is not in existence. It is an argument made sometimes by the Russians, or particularly by President Putin in the first initial phases. I haven't heard that argument recently, not that prominently anymore. He is now using other arguments. And Excellency, if I may also add, Pakistan may have said that it wants to remain neutral in the conflict, but at the same time, it has 
in so many words condemned Russian aggression and asked for the drums the entire lot for them. And if I may also add, coming from a South Asian perspective, something that irritates us and is now almost becoming annoying at the masses level is how what is happening in India to Muslims is completely ignored in the Western narrative of human rights, including what is happening now. It includes raising down their homes and there they firefight on the diplomatic front, but continue to do everything which is against norms of human rights and humanitarian law on their land. <coughs> and with all due respect, sir, the situation in Afghanistan, I think isolating the Taliban and pushing them against the wall has only deteriorated the situation on the ground, including rights for women. And I think the West too needs to rethink its policy there. Putting strangulating them financially, pushing them against the wall has not helped the situation. There is no alternative but them for now in Afghanistan put in place by Western consensus led by the United States. And now abandoning them and they in retaliation now doing things on the ground which have consequences for human beings, for people. I already see why I uh, wanted to come here because we have a very good and uh, a frank discussion. Uh, first, uh, on, on, on Russia and India, uh, on this comparison between Russia, Ukraine, India, Pakistan. You, know, you see also, I, I have to say I'm not a big expert in the history of the, south, the subcontinent, yeah. but I'm an expert in Russian uh, history. And you see, the history of the Soviet Union is also a sort of, I would say, colonization project in the, in the, in the, on their own territory. I mean, they colonized basically all these, particularly the Central Asian and the, and the Caucasian countries. I mean, which are now, which are now independent. Austrian and, Empire, German and, Empire, and, Empire, and then the, the, the crux with the, with the Ukraine yes. is that that is to some extent, the cradle of Russia. That makes it so, uh, I would say, uh, so annoying for the Russians to accept because what is now Russia is actually, or has actually been emerged from Kiev and <coughs> I would say, environment out of Kiev. So, you have an element of colonialism in the history of Russia. And of course, you have still an element of colonialism in the, Rush, in the, in the history of the subcontinent. It's, it's, it's an over, let's say, it's an overlapping, very much overlapping. And I see it. I traveled in India before. If you sometimes, I mean, I'm not now during my stay here in Pakistan, but sometimes in particular in deeper Punjab, you don't not really know whether you are in, in, in Pakistan or in India. Yes, and I mean, even the you know cuisines. Yes, mostly they are Muslims here, and there are Hindus uh, over there. But still, the even the the architecture of the cities. You cannot you cannot really tell, particularly as a foreigner. I mean, you might you might do. But I, I could not. So what I'm saying is this argument, there is a historic, let's say a historic, uh, uh, perhaps a mentality space that calls for the dominance of one ethnic or political or economic group. Uh, the, the, the Russian idea mm -hmm. that might have been uh, uh, emerged from Ukraine or from what, but it has, so to say, submerged and pervaded the whole space, the uh, 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 Euro Eurasian space. And then to say, you know, Russia, that, that is the form. And all the other around Russia, these are, I would say, tributaries. These are, uh, you know, upshots. These are corollaries, these are not really, uh, I would say, spaces that 
are worse of their own existence. This is an argument that can very easily be, be used in each of these situations <coughs> where colonialism and the sometimes artificial drawing of borders have played a role in the in the in the in the, in the past. So that is that is the argument that I hear from some people even here. So I think this to some extent neo-imperialistic approach by the Russian president is a danger for each and every region, Africa as well, because there is also this colonial legacy and borders that are very artificially drawn. I mean, the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is still contested by the, Af by the Afghans. Still. And it, of course it was artificially drawn by the Brits. Uh, but again, at some stage we have to settle things, have we not? So I think this is a very, very dangerous argument. I could not agree with you, though. I had the fortune of visiting Kiev and I had an interaction with the students there. And it was from the Forum of Karachi Council for Foreign Relations. After a very long lecture on peace, the only question the students there wanted to ask me was, how did Pakistan retain its nuclear program and why did we give it up? And right. this was exactly after Crimea. Just the timing was then Crimea had happened. So I think the messaging across is really that. We are going back to a very realist world where you go for yourself. And even with the way the Ukraine war is stretched and all the support that has come from the Western world, it has not been able to do for Ukraine what it was supposed to do. And the signaling in South Asia is terrible. <coughs> the signaling in South Asia is that India being in close convergence with Washington and perhaps also with other European capitals can completely get away with buying first oil from Russia and then subsequently from Iran. So I really think that despite the argument that you've put forward, it makes very good sense. The signals that are getting out for developing countries, for uh, countries in conflict situations from the uh, Russian situation are not very pretty. And I don't think the restraining mechanisms are working because they are selective. NATO has been aggressive in expanding its words. And uh, after the collapse of the USSR, what some kind of countries have been encouraged to apply for NATO membership. Now, seeing things in this context, as uh, Mr. Zelensky requesting uh, the, NATO, uh, the NATO membership, once, wasn't it the last straw on the camel's back provoking Russia that NATO is expanding eastward? Having an aggressive mentality. Now, again, Finland is being encouraged to apply for membership, Finland and Sweden. So, if we have to draw a line, okay, all that Putin was demanding or requesting was neutrality of Ukraine. He never said that we are going to absorb Ukraine. It could have worked as a legitimate and a logical uh, buffer between. Eastern uh, Russia and all of Europe, including. Um, I, I agree with you. There is a, a really a grain of truth in what you said. Uh, although I think the sequence is a bit different. Uh, yes, it is true after the demise of the Soviet Union, there were a number of countries new, I mean, new, new country, newly erected, newly in it. You know, in existence countries <coughs> who then, for their own purposes and for their own political considerations, decided they wanted to join NATO. And for instance, the Baltic countries, part of the Soviet Union, as we all know, they did so. And that was not, uh, I, I would say, that was not uh, received very, I would say, uh, pleasantly by the Russians at that stage. But what can you do? I mean, it has to do with the right of each and every country to determine its own political face, its self-determination. I mean, that is what we are, and, and very rightly so, what you are requesting, for instance, for Kashmir. 
So it's, it's, it was their, I would say, original and genuine right to uh, opt for a closer relationship with NATO. Now, when it comes to the Ukraine and to Georgia and to uh, countries immediately adjoining Russia, you have a point. <coughs> because it's, these are spheres of interest. And as uh, much as the Americans took exception to the Russians being in Cuba in the 60s, as you know, there is a security interest of Russia to be not surrounded by hostile countries. And that led, although there was an application, an Ukrainian application by a democratic, legitimized government to accede to NATO, that was not accepted by NATO in the Bucharest summit in 2000, I think it was eight. What was said was, and it was a compromise, the Germans and the French were against, for the very reasons you mentioned, and others were against. The Americans were pushing it, it's true. So the compromise was, to some extent, in principle, they have a right to exceed, but it has to be discussed in detail. So it was basically a procedural decision, as diplomats used to uh, come up with. If you cannot resolve a, uh, I would say, a dispute, you come up with some procedural thing. But clearly, the Ukrainians were not part of NATO, and clearly the Ukrainians had no clear-cut aspiration to join NATO, because it was said it needs to be discussed in detail. Now, in the last, and that makes me sometimes so weary about the whole Russian argument, this, the appetite of the West, even of the Americans, to, I mean, have the Ukrainians exceed NATO had significantly decreased over the last couple of years. Yes, there was perhaps an American appetite in the, let's say, in the 2008, 9, 10. But since then, with all the problems with the pivot of the Americans toward Asia, and toward China. The appetite for these kind of uh, geopolitical engineering in, in Europe and in the immediate vicinity of Putin has, was absolutely, I would say, on, 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 on a decreasing path. So this very aggressive uh, stance by Putin came to some extent as a surprise. I mean, not that he actually invaded, because that was building up over time. You saw troops there massing for, for weeks and months. But that he actually, you know, took the step to invade and very, very brutally, I mean, a country that he considered to be basically Russia, that, that came as a surprise. I don't think actually that the West, with all respect to what you said, and again, it's not totally wrong. It's that there, there are some elements in, let's say, in these 20 years that led you perhaps to believe there were some tendencies in the West to corner the Russians. Yes, at some stage there was a tendency. You know, the American this was the only superpower. So they, they, they tried to get the most out of it, I think, from a from a power uh, policy perspective, that is even understandable. I'm not saying I I I I talk. Uh, I you know, no, no. Um, this, this, this is a very wonderful. Yes. Question. My question, but following up on your comments about the war in Ukraine and the importance of condemning something that was wrong. So, what is your government's stance on the Kashmir problem? and the increased violence and aggression against the Muslims of that region. How do you think Germany can help in address this problem? Well, we continue to say it's basically uh, a, a question between India and Pakistan. It's a human right -like, uh, situation that is unacceptable. <coughs> and the Chancellor made it quite clear, the former Chancellor Angela Merkel and the uh, uh, 
current charts are made quite clear that the human rights situation in Kashmir is not tolerable. And that the, it, 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 I think the, the, it, it's not, they said it was not, it's not sustainable and we have to cater for the uh, observance of human rights under any circumstance. The, the thing is, of course, that I and also now, I mean, Vilabal also arrested the Kashmir issue. Particularly, he raised also this uh, rather outrageous uh, statements by the BJP spokesperson, or two spokespersons, basically. Um, and the minister said, uh, we uh, do clearly see your point of view and we uh, agree with the human rights aspect here. That is a, uh, I think, a quite severe a pertinent problem that needs to be addressed. And we are doing it. We are not doing it that much in, you know, by, you know, public statements, but we are doing it by talking to the yeah. human rights situation in Kashmir is a standing item on the bilateral. And the Indians don't like that. For instance, I made my remarks with the uh, with the press on uh, also on Kashmir and I can I, I, I really or oh, I I can imagine on return I have the Indian Shahid affair on the phone, with, with which whom I have a quite you know professional relationship. It's no, not a high commissioner there, it's only the uh, Shaji because the, uh, the, the ambassadors were sent home uh, after the August 2019 decision by the Indian government. But I, I'm, I'm quite certain, I have him on the phone saying, oh, I mean, you said there the human rights were the, uh, you know, deficiencies in Kashmir. And I say, yes, that is the position of my government. But I think we should also see, and I think more. I would say, far-sighted Pakistani uh, colleagues in the Foreign Office, but also politicians and people like you, they see that on the other hand, we have a clear improvement in the security situation uh, 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 along the line of control of the last year, which is remarkable. I, I'm not saying that's uh, for the first time, we have seen it before and then it collapsed. But now, in this relatively, I would say, toxic atmosphere after the Indian uh, uh, decisions in August 2019, I, I, I thought that this a very major decision, particularly from the military. It, it was spared by the military. It was not really I would say that by the, by the civilian government. I mean, that's also something about, I mean, you are Pakistanis, you know how the cookie crumbles in this country. So uh, major policy directives are being given by the military. That was such a case. That, and I know the military, those military, there's, they are continuously in contact, which is, which is good. I mean, everybody knows in India and in Pakistan that at some stage, if you want to harness the economic, the sociological, the cultural potential of this region, which is huge, you can only do it together. You can only do it together. I mean, all this talk about connectivity, that is all right and just. It depends first on Afghanistan, and we haven't spoken about Afghanistan. I don't know whether perhaps we have an opportunity directly to try. You mentioned Afghanistan, <coughs> rightly so, rightly so, because to some extent I find the official uh, Pakistani policy has a sort of this uh, symptom of bias remorse that we are seeing, because this enthusiasm I saw last August after the. Uh, fall of uh, Kabul to the Taliban has totally gone, totally gone. So all this connectivity, you will uh, permit me or you will, uh, uh, you will uh, uh, excuse me if I say all these connectivity dreams hinges on one, stability in Afghanistan and second, to come to terms with India. 
Otherwise, it's not feasible, and everybody knows. So it's absolutely necessary. Now, I know Mr. Modi, this is a tough cookie. He has a huge parliamentary majority, other than the respective Pakistani government. This is really a disadvantage, because he can do, I mean, he has not, he does not, he, he does not have to fear you know, that there are backlashes from all sides and perhaps the stability of the of the government is in jeopardy because one, two, three guys are simply crossing the floor. So it's a difference, but also I think uh, basically, I think also Modi understands with all this Hindutva, which is horrible, I know, and it, 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 it runs country to the basic idea of what India stands for. But nonetheless, I think Modi, I'm not talking about some people at the fringes of the BJP, which are very, very, very fascist people. But I think even Modi understands. He's not doing much for the moment, but I think there is now a window of opportunity if there is some kind of stability in Pakistani politics, which is so far not the case, because you know the government that we have is you know a very fragile one, <coughs> and I don't think after, uh, if, you know before there is a new round of elections, I don't think that will be uh, that will change and. Perhaps even after that, I mean, there are all people saying, I mean, Imran Khan and the PGR, they are saying, ah, oh, come on, we may we do the election and everything is settled. I don't think so. I don't think so. They are, they're dreaming of two third majorities. A pipe dream, absolutely a pipe dream. I mean, you know Pakistan better than I do, but a two third majority for the PGI is a pipe dream. So then there's a gaining coalition, again this hacking, and so I don't know that whether there is much more stability in the, in the future government. So moving on to the Just uh, uh, let us speak on trade and investment. We have spoken oh, about the the diplomats. We have spoken about diplomatic relations and political relations. I'm a businessman, so I'm concerned about the trade and investment. Excellency, I mean, thank you very much for supporting us for the GSP. I would like to ask that after 2024, because German was advocating for us to get the GSP, thank you very much for that, you appreciate that. What would be your stand for after 2024 when this will be, uh, this final is required to you? So, we, uh, will, you, will you support us again for the continuation of this uh, GSP? Secondly, we do not see extensive you invested in Pakistan. I mean, uh, you have been investing around other world countries, but not in Pakistan, like in automobiles or energy or other stuff, you know. So, what do you say about that? How, I mean, you can come to Pakistan, what do what you want to have from Pakistan when you can invest in Pakistan? First, just because I think there is a good chance for Pakistan to get the prolongation, I mean, starting in 2024. I'm not saying it's a foregone conclusion, because you know it's a it's a bilateral trade scheme. Trade, I mean, it's basically a bargain between trade advantages for Pakistan on one side, on, on the other, labor law, human rights, civil rights. I mean, for the EU on the other side, and I would say Pakistan has made a lot of progress, but we all know there are deficiencies in civil and human uh, rights situation. Uh, I mean, we still have this question of uh, enforced disappearances. I mean, I know the civilian government cannot do much about it here again. Um, so we have uh, the problem of misuse of the blasphemy law. I'm not saying, I mean, I understand the blasphemy law that belongs to the basic ingredients of this country, and I'm not contesting that, but the misuse of this law, which is very easily to, 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 to some extent to fabricate, at least if we need some reduction, in it, for instance, if you are, um, um, if you are somehow uh, doing something against the railway, you can be punished uh, by death still. So, uh, 
desk is also a, and so we have to reduce the uh, the uh, provisions that uh, allow for desk penalties. So press, I, I think with the new government it has become so far slightly better, slightly, but it's still not all gold that shines in Pakistan. So what I'm saying is. There are, there is still some unfinished business, also with the re regard to trade um, uh, uh, reciprocities. Uh, but by and large, I'm quite certain that Pakistan will not only uh, complete the current cycle successfully, and there is a delegation from Brussels. You know, Brussels is the main player. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A delegation from Brussels is coming. I think in two weeks' time to monitor the situation and to sit together with the Pakistan government to take stock. But then also there is, I think, I would say, decent reason to believe that Pakistan, if they comply with the conditions, and that means to uh, adopt, I think, seven further human and civilian rights conventions. Most of them are already signed, so it's not that big deal. Uh, then I, I would say uh, it's uh, quite likely that Pakistan will get uh, also the next phase of the GSP plus. I'm actually afraid to take the word of the ambassador because we've all been now in the stratosphere of of international political relations oh, and very deep uh, human rights questions. And now we're diving down into the clouds of Better earning rip, money. Rip us. Yeah, rip us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I pull out the spade, so to speak. Um, there is German-Pakistani investment, even now, going on. We are actually, um, I'm always joking, we are unpaid um, on the list of Pakistani officials because we're working um, to improve the image of Pakistan as, as far as the economic conditions are concerned in Germany. Because Germans are... No, they, they are very, uh, they like security, they like safety, and they have these people from left and right who talk to them and say, um, when you invest in a country, uh, is, is, is money laundering an issue, and all these things. So they are very, very careful to which countries they go. And basically the whole world is open to us. So it's a competition amongst different countries, and it's not a decision by the German government to send investment. We always say, like, let's do it. As I said, we're working in your interest by by uh, tearing down some of these terrible stories about security in Pakistan. We do not see a security issue for a German company uh, working. So that's like, we, we talk a lot, we bring delegations, we um, strengthen the chamber, um, our German chamber network is, is extending to Pakistan soon. Um, however, the ground conditions here are not fully conducive to attract a lot of German money because the return on investment uh, is not fully guaranteed. Um, it's, um, you know, the, the, the boundary conditions of economic activities in Pakistan have changed quickly as quick as the government can change, um, the laws change and uh, business doesn't like that. And also there's, um, there's not yet uh, enough Pakistanis abroad, the expats coming to the country and say, yes, Pakistan, we want to invest there. Uh, it's a chance. We always say, like the Germans, the foreigners, they will follow when the experts do it. Um, there are possibilities. I rather would say it's not the German money that is lacking to come to Pakistan. There is enough money in this country. There are good, big conglomerates who would like to invest, who would like to do something new. How much more can you try to develop textile or leather or something? They must, as some others have already started, they must try to attract international technology. And that's where we are the perfect partners, because we do not come colonialized. Definitely not in the economic sphere. We come always as partners. We want other people to earn money so that we can earn money too. Um, one example is, and has been mentioned before, the, the plant um, of Volkswagen um, that uh, is actually being constructed on the other side of the Hub River. So all cities, I'm sorry, it's on the other side of the Hub River, but it's part of Karachi, Greater Karachi. Um, not yet finished, um, it has several hiccups over the years because Volkswagen is careful. But they are coming, um, the investment is proceeding, it's Pakistani money from Premier Motors, it's German 
and um, Czech technology, you know, Skoda is part of the Volkswagen group and Skoda is a little lower price than usually the Volkswagen. That's why the Volkswagen group has decided to enter with a com combination of Skoda and, and Volkswagen. Everything in Pakistan is regulated by the price. Ah, that's how it is. Um, but you will see them here and it's a good step forward. But you see also other investment not in the traditional field. We are no longer consumer goods like the Volkswagen Beetle. We are no high price, high quality. Yeah. And you see the Audis driving on the streets here. Tomorrow the ambassador will inaugurate uh, an electric charger, the first supercharger um, in Pakistan, uh, installed by Siemens, so it's Siemens technology. Audi, which means Premier Motors, has, has, has paid for it, and Libra is, um, is installing it in one of its um, previous gas stations, a petrol station where you have a great tank of CNG. And now they will offer also chargers. And we're talking with others so that this technology, and this is the technology of motion in the future, electric cars, and the charging comes to the country, and German technology is part of it. Premier Motors, like others, they see is like put a little money, take some of your own money, do not put it in banks in Dubai or spend it somewhere, put it in your country. German technology is readily available and will pay. Um, if I walk into uh, tomorrow morning, we will actually go to a company, I will not mention it here, that actually is exporting to Germany in the automotive field. But I, if I walk here into a textile factory, if I walk into a pharma factory, and the successful ones have German machines and German yes. machinery, and they know it's high price, but you have two advantages. It will be long-lasting. It's not a Chinese machinery that will last the guarantee period plus one day. It will happen to last 30 years. Maybe not nowadays anymore, but I've seen um, in Quetta, an old Merck factory where the machines there, they've been there for 60 years. They're yes. still working and they're still producing good things. But there's also the other side. Um, Germany has, uh, uh, has spread into service sectors, into modern technology, into uh, also startups. Um, I was uh, last week visited by the uh, local CEO of Food Panda. You know, Food Panda is a very successful delivery. It's actually um, it's a German company. Uh, Food Panda is owned by Delivery Hero in Berlin. Or it was called Food Panda as well, and Food Panda has expanded from Germany to 70 countries all over the world. It's a 100% <coughs> German company. If you order next time a Food Panda, they cannot do anything about the quality of the restaurant you order from. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, uh, the mechanism should work. The servers, when you order, the servers are in Germany. So if you order something online, it will be processed by a computer in Berlin. Um, we have other companies who come to the country who are interested to develop together with Pakistan range into new fields. And that's where the Germans come in, in, into uh, bearing always, like we have 10, 15,000 students from Pakistan and Germany that learn technology, that learn the medical field. You have the companies that come back and would like to work with these students when they come back in order to promote uh, the way of Pakistani companies to be successful together. We come, the Germans, always with one container, a container full of technology. We're not Chinese when you get two containers, one of technology and one of Chinese. We need Pakistanis, we need to train them and they will work for you in the future. And they will feed their families and they will train others. Thank you. You mentioned about Modi and uh, India very briefly. So I thought I'll give you a few quotations that I just came across a few days back, which perhaps might take the focus off the international scene and bring us to the more local scene. Now there's a magazine which I'm sure you know about that. It's not a magazine, it's, a, it's an organization. It's called the Freedom House in the United States. It's a very large organization that does a lot of research work. They've come up in their report, now just quoted quote from, from the report itself. It said India is not now a flag bearer of being the largest democracy. No. It can now be called the electoral autocracy, which means one person, one absolute power. And that's what you see now, the absolute power. Now it goes on to say, this I'm translating it, so I it there. this is what he means. He says, what we see now in India is fascism, drawn is secularism, 
freedom of domestic values, equality of human and citizens, etc. This is all now buried under the might of Hindustan and the Mughal. Now, that's the sort of feeling that one gets reading an article which somebody written, I'm sure, he written through a lot of experience that he came from it somewhere. So I think that's putting into light as to there is a scene building up abroad which is not life. Now, I'll read further on that. I won't read this, but this is what I'm saying. Now, the pathetic life, which my colleague here mentioned, that the pathetic flight of Muslims in India and occupied Kashmir under the newly enacted laws, so they call them the laws, but they're so severe that I don't think they're very, very uh, simple law uh, as that, are well known and need no repetition in any way. My question, sir, is now that you've heard this aspect of our relationship and how it is and so on and so forth, so, just to go, my question is. Where are the bastions and pillars of human and religious rights, civil liberties, freedom, etc.? And I then further ask, what I want to know, why are the Western media and their parliaments conspicuous by their absence? We don't get to hear any of them. The media, there is silent. The parliaments, there are silent. I saw one resolution passed by the European Union. About nine months ago, ten months ago, I read it out also. And that was a very good one. But then, after that, just complete silence. Just complete silence. I, at least I haven't seen it. I, I went through the EU resolutions and I didn't see any cash there. So, what I've just read out shows that there is a tremendous amount that is, is, is missing as a gap. And it's not being, it's not being plugged in by, uh, by people who can, people like yourself, for instance. If you were to write a report like this, that you had a meeting like this, and this is what we had to say. They can decide in, 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 in the people that matter as to what should be given to the media and why not. And then release it. Let the media be free to talk about India and what's going on there. There's a fantastic amount going on there, which has been hidden so far. So I feel honestly that the, the embassies here and the general public here would like to know as to how much is being transmitted from here to show the activity of these countries. So that this can reflectively the media. And perhaps there are parliaments there. That's my opinion. Well, after all. I'm not contesting what you're saying or what you're what, what you were citing. I think that reflects well the uh, quite depressing situation I think in Kashmir. Uh, I would perhaps tend to be a bit more cautious on you know the characterization of uh, uh, you know uh, Prime Minister Modi and you know that there are fascist elements within the BJP or within the Hitler uh, uh, movement, I'm, 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 I'm not ignoring. But I think Mr. Modi is particularly a populist. And you see populist, we see all over the world. He is, you know, seeing where he can make the most in terms of, you know, voters and popular, uh, I, I mean, in, in the past, I mean, we have we have seen uh, horrible things as it was uh, chief minister Gorbachev, well uh, but uh, I mean, we, there were also phases where he was quite, I would say, reasonably dealing with Muslim countries, and he has excellent relations with some Muslim countries, particularly Gulf countries. So I don't think he is a populist. And populists we see all over the world. We have seen at the helm of the US, and we have seen the populists. I mean, perhaps we will see you again. Yeah. So you are uh, you are not uh, you are not shielded from populism and people who I mean uh, basically uh, are devoid of any major political principle just to get the votes they want to get. So, and then here again, I mean, you know India much better than I do. There is still, and I would say the same for Pakistan. I mean, again, Pakistan has a very, as we all know, upside down in democratic, I would say, policy in this country. But in India, there is still a decent degree of institutional, I would say, setup, setup, and build up. 
And I think as much as we have to have trust in, for instance, the Pakistani judiciary, I mean, we have seen in the, in the past, it's, it's a mixed bag. Yes, also the Pakistani judiciary is not, you know, impeccable. But I think the same um, attitude I would give still to the democratic and institutional setup in India. Again, I'm not saying what we are saying that is for the moment acceptable and nice to see. No. But I think there is still a decent degree of institutional uh, setup that could perhaps at least mitigate or perhaps even correct the wrong. That at least should be our aim, and that to some extent should also be Pakistan's approach. Because again, my sense is you can harness the potential of this country and of this continent, this subcontinent, everything together. At least in the long run. I know it's difficult. It's not for the next 40 days to do, but I think in the long run, I think there is no other option than that. We talk about textiles, talk about pharmaceuticals and everything else, but we never talk about logistics, which are the key to the growth of economy we've seen everywhere in the world. The Germans are really great in providing the logistics. Uh, we've been working with them on off and on basis, and we realize that they are really good. They have a very really fine quality, especially with shipping and airlines. I wonder what's keeping them back. Um, we have a coach many times, but uh, there hasn't been much response except that a few companies have come here like Kun and Hagel and they worked around here, but they never grew, they never expanded themselves. And the shipping lines like uh, Upper Glory used to be here, but this did not come down. <coughs> and then there was again a few more companies, uh, older offers there, but unfortunately it never grew. Uh, then again, we have a lot of uh, logistics sites, we can also look at warehousing. State of art facilities, they're very good at that. We've got the excellent machinery. Is well, there? I, 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 I agree with first what you said. The question is what, what, what holds them back? I mean, you have to understand, and uh, Holger Ziegler alluded to that. I mean, Germans are not very, I would say, uh, oh, Germans are risk averse, particularly, I would say, potential investors. And then we have to say most of the, I would say, cutting edge companies in Germany, these are middle or even small sized enterprises. They invest their own money. And of course, that, that gives them a particularly degree of caution. And then, I would see you mentioned that there are other investment options available where the investment conditions are, I, I agree with you, they have been, they have been on the bank in Pakistan recently. I agree with that. But still, as he said, the uh, possibility to return your money relatively easily from Pakistan into Germany is relatively difficult. You have still litigation problems, particularly big companies. You have political influence. I'm not saying that is different in other countries, but Perhaps at some stage, the I would say the yield of the investment is perhaps higher other than other, uh, yes. elsewhere. And then you have to see uh, these these people are, you know, sometimes I, I made a round in German Chamber of Commerce together with the Pakistani ambassador. He was a great guy, by the way, and uh, Mohammed Faisal. And we, we visited two Chamber of Commerces and we were together promoting, I mean, uh, trade and investment relations in Pakistan. And then, uh, interestingly, two people were uh, asking uh, Mohammed, uh, asking, uh, why, oh, we understand that you want German companies to invest in Pakistan, but Tell me first, why are so few Pakistani investing in their country? Which is to some extent true. There is an absence of investment of Pakistanis in their own country. 
I mean, I'm not talking about construction of these guys, board and you know this kind of things where you can you know has a lot of subsidies and so central bank is pumping money in you. I'm not I'm not criticizing that. I mean, Pakistani business people are business people too, but when it comes to I would say risky investments, Pakistanis <coughs> themselves are very often shying away for making decent investments. And that's a decent question. Mohammed was a bit, I would say, wavering around and then and, and a bit stuttering. So that is a question I the Pakistanis is first and foremost have to be answered. But uh, just that. That. Basically, it was not that for the high driven investment. Yeah. If you're talking about it, you're talking about the first place for the Pakistanis. Because when we invite some students to come and work with Let's say for a hypothetical reason, like if you're asking a shipping company to come to Pakistan, what are they investing? I think he said that the local agents are not investing anything on behalf of them, and they're just putting the money for what they can do, yeah, offer the service, and then they get returns on that, which every company does. I think basically it's, it's something that one needs to really go into that field and explain to them, which yeah, I have found. I all, all the countries haven't really processed into that area. We, we are trying our best, particularly all of it, does, but again, as here in our system, we cannot direct German companies to invest in Pakistan. I mean, you can only persuade them, you can talk to them, you can try to, how to say, to uh, somehow address their mostly uh, exaggerated or even false concerns about security situation and you know all that that we can do but i mean the decision has has to be made of course by them no, no, obviously i appreciate that yeah. that everyone has a decision but i'm trying to no i i see your point and that's very very helpful for the for next argument because we need to have to yeah, we have, I, I, have to yeah. wind up yeah, so I'm, I, 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 I have to say i'm really i mean the the, the council was true to its uh, reputation because i've heard there is a, a open and frank atmosphere of discussion and uh, 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 intellectual quarrel even, that is good, and I really enjoyed uh, the interaction with you all. And since we have listened to all your arguments and discussions, and it's been a very pleasant uh, listening. I have a little more understanding which a lot of people do not know, and perhaps you also do not know, but I've worked for 20 years with East West Institute, um, and, uh, Person, but the people that I worked with in Brussels, the Ambassador Gunter Palfrit, yeah, and then Ambassador Peter Metcalf, yes, and then Ambassador Martin Fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I worked with them, and therefore I put a little understanding of where the German German position. Yes. And uh, obviously, the personal side, my grand uncle, uh, uh, he worked with. One of the founders of People's Party, Mr. Gary, married a German. And another grand on my father's side, another from my mother's side, uh, also was uh, Dr. Anasavik, who was actually uh, did it uh, in Munich in 1936 and was taken prisoner along with the German legation and moved to um, Bombay. Uh, so I have another history behind. I think, you know, my own feeling after hearing you and all that. Uh, and seeing, I came to Moscow a number of times with East Assistant. And I always found the Russians were very comfortable with the Germans. Yeah, yeah. Very comfortable. Yeah. They were comfortable. Yes. Right. yes. yes. And there were no, yeah. there were no edges in fact. No, no. And I think it's a very good observation. Yeah. In fact, we. At least twice we met Putin along with the delegation and it was a very open discussion. I think recently with all the events that have happened, the most striking thing which I find in Germany was your rearmament. That was a very, very striking. It was the first time a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift in this. And uh, obviously, uh, Nothing is very simple, but it is complicated as to where 
in Ukraine, the Ukrainians there during the Great War, the Russian speaking, the German speaking, etc. But my, my, my only point is that I do think that Germany should take a stronger, more positive role uh, than they have been. And you have done it but in the recent past, in France and only France. You and France have actually led Europe. This thing has not come to pass. Europe was certainly bound to a certain direction, very positively. And I think, I think that Germany should now assume its right to do. And one of the things, investment in um, uh, I was a director of uh, General Tires with the Continental <coughs> Investment, you know, Continental uh, Tires, so, yeah, in, uh, invested in, in uh, this many years. But I think, you know, I find that there is a lot of commonality between uh, Germany and uh, many issues. And I think this needs to be post multiplied. And I think, uh, you know, this discussion, uh, you know, we, should not, we should carry on this interchange of ideas and take, carry on the ideas at the local level in Karachi and also in Islamabad. Because what we need to do is have more frank discussions. Because it is only the discussions that you can avoid conflict, not so much. So I think that I am very grateful to you. I am very grateful to you and being here and, 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 uh, and giving us so much time. Uh, yes. I'm straight from the airport. Your tenure here in the factory is but at the end of my term, oh, yeah, all the chairman, all the chairman. Both of us are in the same. That's a swarm song. So I thank you for coming. Thank, thank you very much, chairman. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.